Maxine, you have an incredible reputation in this business. You always get the story. Great tits as well. Fantastic tits. Um, you command your staff like none other. They're friends of yours. You don't alienate anyone. You don't boss anyone around. But you are absolutely infamous. You hate celebrity journalism. You hate anything to do with Hollywood. You hate celebrities with a passion. Is that true? You couldn't be any truer if you tried, Susan McCoppin. I absolutely hate it. I fell into this business completely by accident. Um, I had lost my job. I was working for a small movie magazine, like a proper reputable one. Mm -hmm. um, lost my job. And a very good friend of mine who works at the National Enquirer said to me, I think you'd be a really good reporter in tabloid business. And I was like, hell no. And so he's like, no, come on, try it out. You know, it could be fun. So I do it. And I actually started working for The Globe. And that is The Globe. Um, and it's like sub-Star Magazine. Oh, it's way like Star Magazine. It's like, oh my God, The Globe. Put it this way, it was awesome. I would ring up on a story and I would say, can I speak to Mr. Winehouse? And the receptionist would say, oh, who's calling? And I'd say, it's Maxine Page and I'm calling from The Globe. And they'd say, which Globe? As in Boston Globe. Really? And I would go, The Globe. The Globe. And you know what? Every time... That person was always on the phone or not available. So I started working there and, you know, basically this is going back 14 years ago. Okay. Now, the Globes, the poster child for the Globe is kind of like um, Phyllis Diller. That's the Globe's <laughs> centerfold. Oops, centerfold. Centerfold. And, you know, with the stars that they like to cover, there literally is three or four of them falling dead like flies every single week. I'm the newbie on the block, so I'm basically assigned the task of going out and doing all the death calls. So I'm the one that's traipsing around, knocking on the door of some poor widow in Beverly <gasps> Hills, saying, Hi, I'm Maxine from the Globe. And obviously she'd say, which Globe? And I would say, <laughs> the Globe. And I would say, our readers were a huge fan of your husband, who I'd actually never heard of because I grew up in England, but apparently right. he's big here. Um, and she would slam the door in my face. Uh, right. And sometimes they called me sick. Sometimes they called me a parasite. Mm -hmm. um, I had been called a vulture. Um, I have been called a lot worse. You know, it's true. Uh, usually I get called a cunt. <laughs> so, oh, that's how I take vulture. Appropriate. Um, but yeah, so that's how I started out. And then I just clawed my way up. I actually just fell into it. And it happened that I was pretty good at it. But you know what? Anyone who's got a brain, who's smart, who can talk to people, and who's tenacious and ballsy can get on in this business. And you know, it really ain't fucking rocket science. So I remember I worked for you at Star Magazine. You were my editor. I was your reporter. And I remember having a meeting with you and Lee Hannon, who was another editor. And you would instruct us, your staff, to try to do drugs and drink with celebrities because as a strategy. Because that way you, you would always say, you broke now you've broken the law together, and they're more liable to be forthcoming with you. So we were actually under direct orders from you and Lee Hannon to do drugs with celebrities. You want to comment? Susie, I, I think you remember that a little bit incorrectly. <laughs> One, I would, as an upstanding citizen <laughs> and an upstanding poor in the tabloid community. Yeah, I, I, if I can interrupt you, you have uh, some coke right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, damn it. Yeah. You know, I would never, ever encourage any of the, 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 the beautiful young staff that I treat like my own children. Right. You know how much I love children. I really love children. I do love children. <laughs> you know, I would never encourage them to do anything like that. <laughs> Secondly, what you're saying kind of goes along the line of extortion. <laughs> and someone said that's a little bit illegal. <laughs> so, no, Susie, I think you remember that wrong. I did, yes, say, you know, have a few drinks. Although what I would say is, make sure you pepper them every now and then with a water and pretend it's vodka. So, and I always say, that's true. Never drink and drive. That's true. Do you know? So, Susie, I think, I mean, I do know situations of certain paparazzis doing that. One example was Heath Ledger at the Chateau Marmont. I was supposed to be there that night. I bet you were. I was supposed to be there that night and I was too tired. So it wasn't your ass. They were blowing the lines of coke. It was not my ass. It so should have been my stunned ass. But yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I've never actually told anyone to do that. I, I seriously I seriously. I know haven't. Lee, Lee Hannon specifically would tell us well, to do that. Let's bleep out his oh, name. Oh, sorry, yes. Anyway, but yes, yes. Mr. Okay. Mr. X. 
mistakes. I'm sure has uh, done that. But no, I actually never have done that, Suze. But, as I said, I know people have. And yeah, with Heath Ledger, it was a terrible story because basically the pap was a cheeky, chirpy, chappy, good friend of mine. He basically chummied up to him. As Darren. Darren. Hmm? Darren? No. Darren. Well, it was Irk. Um, first name. Okay. Well, bleep those names. Yeah. yeah. So basically, they chummied up to Heath and pretended they were just, you know, Joe Schmo's fans went back to his room and then were blowing lines of coke and one of them made sure the windows, like, curtains were open and there was someone outside secretly filming. Oh, now, because genius. it basically was coercion and because they were participating in illegal activity, the tape would never went wide. However, when he died, mm. it was a whole different matter and that tape actually did run, I think, Entertainment Tonight, I think it was, ran it right. and they got lambasted for it. Mm. It was like two days after he died. Like, too soon. Too soon. Yeah, I think so. The Globe was even like, ooh, that's hacky. <laughs> the Globe is the bastion of Indeed. standards and decency. It's like the Library of Congress. <laughs> what is the sluttiest thing you've done for a story? Oh, Jesus, are you kidding me? I, I never thought I would say this, but I've actually got to the point where I've started quoting Boy George. And as Boy George says, I would rather have a cup of tea than have sex right now. Thank you very much. I'm living in Hollywood. I'm 43 years old. I am no longer 110 pounds. 14. If I wanted to have sex for a story, no one's going to have sex with me, Sue. I ain't you, babe. That's why I like to surround myself by beautiful young women. And I'm like that evil witch in Snow White. And I basically mm. suck off of your beauty. Yes. You're the and your youth. Yes. Right. And I try and absorb it, along with lots of Botox. Um, and, yeah, if I need to get laid, I just pay for a gigolo. <laughs> we all have our methods. We do. What story are you most proud of having broken? <laughs> <laughs> Susie, let, let least ashamed of. Okay, least ashamed. Okay. Least ashamed. Well, you know, I, I, this is the thing, okay, because I have a really sort of conflicted relationship with this business. I, I'm not ashamed of doing what I do. I mean, I think that the stories are ridiculous. I think these celebrities are ridiculous. Yeah, let me add, actually, let me interrupt you. Let me ask you that question. What, what if somebody comes up to you and says, how do you sleep at night? How do you respond? I, I mean, seriously, I sleep absolutely fine. Actually, I don't. I have really bad problems sleeping. But yeah, it has but it's, it's nothing <laughs> to do with this. You know, I can't sleep because I just watched one of the documentaries. As you know, that's all I do is one just depressing soul sapping documentaries that made me sob my heart out. And you lie. So, yeah. I can't sleep at night because, you know, I'm thinking about Matthew Shepard being beaten to death. Or I'm thinking about poor young girls in Afghanistan being married to 95 year old war. You know, that's what I'm thinking about. I ain't thinking about Kim Kardashian's ass, honey. <laughs> yeah. Like, and we hurt Britney Spears' fucking feelings. I couldn't get for it for this. $200 million. Dollars. I read the New Yorker. Bite me. I don't read... Grazia magazine. You know, I read the fucking New Yorker. I'm a real person. I don't give a shit about any of them. That's it. I think the story, if I was to say any, that I was proudest of, um, I'm going to say, actually, as ridiculous as it sounds, um, th there's two. Mm. The first one I'm going to say was Paris Hilton's homophobic rant caught on tape. Oh, oh, excellent. I loved it. She was in the back. We actually, the taxi driver contacted us. And he taped her call, which is actually legal in New York. It's one party state, and she was in his cab. And the reason why he taped it was because he heard her, like, coming out with stuff about gay people. Oh, ooh, they've all got AIDS. Like, ooh, gay people are so gross. His brother had actually died from AIDS. His brother was gay. And so he was so disgusted, he switched on the recorder and he taped it. And so... It was a monumental negotiation that I kept fighting with my then boss. I mean, he wanted to kill the story. I'm like, no fucking way are we killing this story. What, uh, I can't stand Paris. What magazine? Was it uh, no, it was Radar. It was Radar, it was radar. Right. So what happens is basically, first of all, her rep rings and her rep says, that is not Paris Hilton. And I'm like, that is Paris Hilton. A colleague of mine actually went to school with Paris Hilton and she said, yes, it was. And Paris has two voices. I think everyone knows this. She's a bit like Michael Jackson. She has a Michael Jackson squeaky voice. Then she has a gravelly man voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big like, old plates of meat feet and a big old swimmer. Yeah, shoulder. like James Earl Jones. Like her real voice she's is like, hey. She's like, a, she's like a fucking navvy. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so she has a navvy voice. And so then, I mean, it went through. The, honestly, it's a three-day negotiation. First of all, they're flat out denying that it was her. Then they start coming around. It was. Then they start saying, "Well, actually, it's illegal 
for you to run that. Like, I actually know it's not. And this went on and on and on, like three days. In the end, we ran it. And we did it because we agreed that we'd try and put it in context. So we put some quote in there about how, you know, the, 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 the quotes that were taken out of context would actually make it seem strange. Paris loves her gay friends. She was actually saying it as means of concern for her homosexual friends that she's very concerned may contract HIV. And she said it as a message for gay people to actually start using and practicing safe sex. Oh, really? Wow. So I love that story. CNN, I mean, not that they're real news anymore, but CNN <laughs> ran it like everyone. It was Awesome, and I fought through the nails that story Good. even to go. Right? But the thing that was great as well is the rep kept saying, oh, you know, your source, he's just trying to make money off this, trying to make money off of Paris. And I was like, you know what, bitch, we never told her this, but he actually asked us to donate the fee that we paid him for the audio recording for materials. He actually asked us to donate to the HIV charity. Swear to God, such a great dude. The other story, um, it, uh, Actually, can I talk about this on camera? Yeah, hell. So I was working for a publication and um, I was sitting with my then boss and we were brainstorming ideas for a front cover for, we wanted a big, powerful front cover. So we were thinking, we're like, okay, Brad and Angelina's when they're first together, no one had started any wedding rumors, nothing. So we're like, she's getting married. So then we sit there and we brainstorm where she's going to get married and we're like, Okay, so I'm like, George Clooney's Lake Como Villa. You're the one that came up with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I have to George write every week about how they're going to get married in Lake Como for, like, seven I was, years. I was the first. <laughs> I was the first. The first time. Because it was genius. Because he's friends with Makes Brad. Sense. You know, it's like the middle of nowhere. It's mm -hmm. private. You know, so we did it. The whole thing. And then, obviously, in true tabloid sense, you have, you come up with the guest list and come up with who, you just Google and look at the local floor. So and so's doing the flowers, you know, Ooh. all this bullshit. So, did that whole thing. So, it ran, front cover. Because I was like, yeah, that's great. So, my hand to God, my mum rings me like a week later from England and she says, oh, I heard on the BBC, the BBC, <laughs> Brad and Angelina. Are getting married this weekend at George Clooney's Lake Como Villa. Did you know about that? I'm like, know about it? I made it up. <laughs> I have that conversation with my mom every week. Every week, like the other day, she was like, "Did I heard Kim Kardashian eats her own placenta?" Yes. I'm like that's me. I did that. So you can get away with it in the magazines. Websites, not so much. Yeah. Like you know, because if you're a website, well, it depends on the type of website. If you want it to be like a proper, respected news website. You've got to have your facts straight, and yeah. you can't get away with that bullshit. But the weeklies, I mean, it's, it's a lot, lot of creative license. A lot of creative license, yeah. No, it's not. That's true. It's a victimless crime. Um, thank you, Maxine. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good.